2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 through 10. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into the paradise and heard things that are not to be told, that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. The word of God for the people of God. All right. Well, this text that Beverly read for us, I don't know about you, but it's one that I hear it and I go, that brings several questions up. Uh, there's some interesting little facets in there. I hope to cover a couple of them at least briefly um, before moving into really the heart, I think, of Paul's message for us and for the word for us today. The first is you have this interesting conversation where Paul has done, he's done this recently and he does this again, where he's using the third person but he's trying to really, he's describing himself, right? He's talking about this idea that this experience that he had where he went up to the third heaven, which is not something most of us use in our common vernacular very often, but this notion that he had this really special religious vision and experience um, years ago. And he's doing a little play here where he's talking to the Corinthians and wanting to show that, look, if somebody had a reason to boast about anything. He could, he could give all the reasons. He has the most experiences, the most amazing things to ever be able to boast about. And yet, he's wanting to teach them that that's not what life should be about, and that's not what the Christian faith is about, is trying to somehow one-up one another and become a people who are prideful and leading from a place of boasting. No, instead, he's wanting to sh point them in this other direction, right? Where just like we talked about with the children in small talk, we move to a place of humility. We move to a place where we actually want to lean into our weaknesses because there we experience Christ's power. There we experience Christ's strength. And so he's doing this kind of back and forth. I can't, I can't tell you all that much more about this third heaven idea. Um, so... Um, but that's part of the point, right, is that it's not about that. It's not about this sort of unique, um, special experience that Paul had. It's about our one God who is there for everyone and is there for all of us in all of our weaknesses. And then you have this notion of this thorn in the flesh that he's given. And you could probably guess, whenever you have kind of mysteries in Scripture, a lot of people spend a lot of time trying to work on that and figuring out there's been a lot of ink spilled on this one. But from what I can tell, at least... Um, we really don't know exactly what he's talking about. We don't know exactly what this, um, this impediment, um, which might be a good translation for, for the, what we call thorn in his, his side that, or thorn in the flesh. Um, but he's got something in his life. Paul's got something in his life, and it sounds like maybe he expected the people around him would understand what, what he was talking about, that Satan was using to get in the way of of his faith and of his life. It was something, it, 
this could be a person, this could be a struggle he had, it, it's, it's really not clear. But what we know is it was something that he experienced and interpreted as, as a weakness that was being used by Satan to get in the way of him you know, living as he wanted to live for Jesus and being the full evangelist and leader in the church that he was called to be. It's an interesting idea for us because he wants to show that, hey, he had, weak, he had an impediment that was given to him by Satan, and yet God could use it for God's purposes. Okay, this is the clear, clear part of it. It's not important, really, what it, what it was, what this thorn in the side is. It's okay if, if we have disagreements or all kinds of people have opinions about what that is. That's not the key message here. The key message for us is that the enemy, people in this life can have things where they are seeking to get in the way of who God has created us to be and called us to be, but God can use it for God's purposes. And what's happening here, right, is that, yeah, he's been given his thorn in the flesh. He's been given this impediment in life. And yet what's happening is God's not taking away from him Instead, God is using it as a, as a way for him to experience God's power. Because right in the midst of that, with all the, whatever that impediment is, trouble is giving him, God is still at work. And it is pointing to God's power in the midst of Paul's weakness or Paul's impediment that he's experienced. He's, it also probably brings us back to think about Job, right? And to think about all that Job went through. And it could be that the enemy uses these experiences that are, you know, meant to do us harm and meant to test our faith. And God says, this is just going to show us God's strength because I'm going to show up and work in this person's life and help them to overcome whatever these temptations or trials or weaknesses or thorns may be. God is there for us in the midst of all of those things. Nobody, ultimately, right, can do us harm because God's grace is sufficient. And that is one of the key phrases that Beverly read for us in 2 Corinthians 12, right? That God's grace is sufficient for us, and the power of Christ dwells in us. What this power of Christ is doing, and I just want to make sure we don't miss this because it's kind of so amazing, we, we, we could almost want to go past it because it's too hard to even think about this could be true, but it is, friends. The power of Christ is the power for us to be transformed, we, because of God's grace, because of God's power at work in us, we are becoming little Christ. We are those who are to become the body of Christ. I know we all know our own weaknesses and our own brokenness, and it can seem like, how could this be what life is to be for me? But friends, this is part of the good news of Jesus Christ, that Christ's power dwells in us in such a way that we are able to be transformed. Yes, limited, broken ones like you and myself are able to become agents of God's love. We are able to become people who become the hands and feet of Christ, people who literally are being used by God to bring the good news into every place in this entire world. This is part of what is happening in us. And literally, when you talk about Christ dwelling in us, that means that in the midst of whatever weakness we have, whatever thing that is happening, whether it's from the enemy, whether it's our own cause, whatever is getting in the way of us living out as God has called us to be, God's grace is sufficient for us that Christ would even dwell within us, that near to us. Think of Christ within your very bodies, helping you to grow, helping you to be more like Christ, helping you to overflow God's very love. This is what is possible in Christ. I have to tell you, this is something that I got to experience in a very meaningful and personal way for me firsthand several years ago. Some of you know, many of you probably don't. I had a traumatic brain injury in 2009, and it brought a very low moment in my life. It was a scary time for me because I, a lot of my identity was kind of in my education um, and a lot of my sort of uh, under, self-understanding and understanding of call had to do with kind of mental capacities. And I'd gone through this traumatic brain injury, and I was struggling. I was struggling to have any kind of memory at all. I mean, I couldn't remember what happened, you know, an hour ago. I was having trouble to think about what that meant for me in life. I had this call to be a 
United Methodist pastor, and I thought, how is this going to work? I don't remember who I visited me 30 minutes ago. How, how am I supposed to serve a church in that way? And it was a very, very low point for me. But thanks be to God, whose grace is sufficient. I have a mentor in Maryland. I was living in Tennessee at the time when this happened. And I spoke to my mentor uh, in Maryland on the phone. And he said, you know, John, I think you need to, to come out here. Um, and so um, my parents helped me out with that. And I was able to travel to Baltimore and be with my mentor, Joe. And one of the things that he did was he brought me to um, a, con a convent or monastery, a place for monastic tradition, and he left me there for a time and said, you just need to be with God. You just need to be still. You need to be able to just be in God's presence with no other pressure than that. Your job is just to rest and to, and to be with God. And so I did that for a time. And in that, again, very low moment, God came to me in such a powerful way. And God helped me to understand that all that I was and all that I could ever be was just somebody who wants to be a vessel for God. And so God, it's God's power that I'm going to rely on whether I'd had this accident or not, whether I was the smartest person in the world or the least intelligent person in the world. All that ultimately mattered was God was going to use me. And so I could put my trust in God that it didn't matter, that God was going to use me however God needed to, and I could just rest in that. I could just get peace from that. I didn't have to feel this pressure on myself of what I had to perform. God doesn't need my help, right? God is going to use me however God needs and however God desires. And in that time, I felt like I came to a place in my faith that honestly, I don't know that I've been back there since. I hope I can be, but I got to a place in prayer where I felt like, you know, this is what life the meaning of life completely is. This is what shalom is all about. I just want to be used for God, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what that looks like and what that means. It might mean that I can't use words sometimes. It might mean that I can't have the job that I think I'm going to have. It could mean all kinds of things, um, but as long as I'm just seeking to do God's will, then I'm, then I'm okay, and God's going to answer that prayer, and God's going to lead me in how to do that. Um, as you have experienced, right, I was able to come out of that time in a lot of ways and got through that and was really blessed by some wonderful therapy and wonderful healing. But really, I still want to never forget that, that place of weakness because from that weakness, from that place of need is when I really experience God's power probably in the most um, powerful way and most meaningful way I have ever in this life. And I hope it's an example of something that we all do. I hope we all, instead of pretending like we don't ever have any weaknesses, pretending like we don't have any struggles, instead we can actually lean right into those realities in our life because those are places where we will experience God's sufficient grace, where we will experience God's power that is able to heal us. And I don't just mean physical healing, though certainly it can mean that, but I, I mean God's power to be able to transform us and use us right in the midst of those struggles and weaknesses we have. Paul goes on to talk about how many types of struggles and weaknesses he had, some completely, you know, what we'd call persecution by others. And yet, going through each of those things, he experienced Christ's power more and more and the way that Christ was able to continue to use him and use his life right in the midst of being beaten up, right in the midst of all his struggles. And the same is true for every single one of us. You know, in our society, I know you all have seen these moments, sometimes they're put on TV and everything, where somebody has some great fortune, right? Um, or they have some great, you know, accomplishment. It could be a, a sports accomplishment. It could be somebody, you know, getting very fortunate in life in some way. And oftentimes, not always, but I'd say a, a vast majority of the times probably in our society, honestly, it seems like probably because they're not sure what else, how else to explain it, They'll give praise to God, or they'll say thanks be to God, or they'll say I'm so blessed. I've seen it from people who I know uh, are not are not, you know, faith pack practicing Jesus following people, and yet in that in that moment they kind of can't think of what else to say, um, and they and there's really no other explanation because of the profound happiness they're feeling or the pr profound fortune that they're feeling, and they say praise be to God, and so we join them in praising God for those good moments, and that's wonderful, but. 
where I think we really experience the fullness of God's power is, is actually not in those moments of success, not in those moments where we don't really know if somebody's really praising God or they're really just proud of themselves, they're thinking how lucky they are or how they did such a good job. But instead, when we really experience Christ's power is when we're able to be like children and say help, when we're able to come to God and say, gosh, I've got this struggle here. I've got this weakness here. I've got something that's really our thorn. And yet, God, I know that you can work right here in the midst of me and then through whatever I'm going through. And that's where we really experience, I think, the fullness of God's power in this life. And so, friends, do you all hear the good news of Jesus Christ today? That in every situation that we can ever go through, yes, yeah, sure, the highs, and they're great, but especially even maybe the lows and the weaknesses that we all have and experience at times, that Christ has the power to save, that Christ's power will dwell in us in such a way that we are able to be used by God that we are able to experience God's healing, God's presence, God's love right in the midst of our very need. And in doing so, we are able to give glory to God. We are able to show the good news of Jesus Christ as we become the church anew. Friends, God loves you so much that there is nothing that we need to ever hold back from bringing to God. That's the, how sufficient God's grace is for us. There's nothing that any one of us could go through or could have. We could, you could think of all the possible possibilities, and it can be things that you think of as your own fault or things that are not your fault at all or some combination. It doesn't matter, friends. God's grace is sufficient for us in every single circumstance, in every single weakness we can have. So may we bring them anew to God. May we bring ourselves anew to God and experience love experience life, experience the power of Christ's presence anew this day and always. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As our choir comes forward to lead us in our hymn of response, would you say yes to the Spirit's invitation? We know the Word of God is present with us anew today and speaks to us personally. Let us Say yes with courage to whatever God is putting on our hearts and minds as we stand as able, praising God with just a closer walk. <laughs>